Have mercy. Yeah. Yeah. Church, this morning, I want to tell, talk to you a little bit about salvation. Yeah. And, and how you can earn your salvation. In some ways that, that uh, are, are similar, I'm going to give you some examples of, of things that uh, you ought to do in order to earn your salvation. Um, but understand that there's a difference between earning something and deserving it. Because whether as good as we, we like to think we are, as, as righteous as we like to think we are, we come to, to worship every Sunday, we, we try our very best to, to, to be perfect, to do everything that God has set out for us to do. But the truth of the matter is, we're never, ever going to meet the mark. We're always going to fall short in some way. Whether you thought something that was sinful, whether you did something that was simple. Well, See, all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. And you know, if somebody says that they have not sinned, then they, they, they have lied. They, they made themselves into a liar because all have sinned. See, we're, we're all going to fall short of, of that mark. Mm -hmm. See, we're never going to deserve the salvation that God is going to give us if we follow him. We're never going to deserve it because in order to deserve it, you would have to be Jesus Christ. Yeah. You would have to live the same exact life that Jesus lived. And we know that that is impossible. impossible. It is impossible to be the perfect being as God in the flesh called Jesus Christ was. Well. It's, it's impossible. So there's nothing that you can do to deserve the gift of salvation. But there are some things that you have to do to earn it. Well, Understand the difference between deserve mm -hmm. and earn it. Right. There are, there's a difference. Yeah. This deserve means it's entitled well, to me. God, right. you owe me that's salvation. Right. That's what you say when you deserve it. Mm -hmm. But God don't owe you nothing. Amen. God don't owe you nothing. Nothing. See, think about like how sometimes children get yes. They okay. feel like they're entitled yeah. to some things. They right. feel like you owe me my PS4. Wow. <laughs> you, you better buy me my Xbox One. Yeah, I heard that before. Mm -hmm. You owe me this. I don't owe you nothing. Wow. <laughs> no. Understand there's a difference between deserving something okay. and earning something. See, you don't deserve salvation, but you have to earn it. See, I don't owe you this PS4, but because you've got all A's on your report card, okay. you have done something to earn it. Right. You understand the difference? Yeah. You understand the difference? You don't deserve it. You earn it. So salvation is something that is earned. Yes. Okay, But it is also a gift because we don't deserve it. So you got all A's on your report card and you earned your PS4, but it's still a gift right. because I didn't have to right. give you the opportunity to That's get it. Right. See, some parents say you got all A's. Oh, good. Well, you're supposed That's to. Right. But, but some others will say you got all A's and I'm going to give you this gift. See, that's something that is nice. They're, they're doing it out of the kindness of their heart. That's what God is doing. Out of the kindness of his heart, he is giving you the gift of salvation, but still you have to earn it. Amen. Because if you don't get those, you don't get all A's, you're not getting it. You understand? There is there is a, 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 a there is a requirement yes. in order to receive. Yes. So how do we receive salvation? Well, let's let's look at this. Let's look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 4. You heard it read this morning. <clears throat> Paul said, I have fought the good fight. Mm -hmm. Paul was in a battle. Mm -hmm. yeah. Aren't you in a battle today? Yes. Everybody's in a battle. Yes. We're all fighting. Mm -hmm. We're all pressing towards the mark of perfection. We're all trying to, to earn our keep. We're all trying to send up some timber. We're all trying to, to make our place in heaven. Paul said, I have fought the good fight. And we're not fighting um, against, against physical beings. We're fighting against principalities and powers and, and, and those evil spirits that are trying to, to draw us onto the wrong path. But 
But Paul says, I fought the good fight and I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. Notice what Paul said he did. And then notice what Paul said is a result of what he did. In the next verse, he says, henceforth, now, as a result of, henceforth, as a result of that, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, yeah, right. which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearance. See, Paul said he fought yeah. a good fight. That's right. He finished his course, mm -hmm. and he has kept the faith. See, if you want to have salvation, if you want to earn salvation, you have to fight the good fight. That's right. You have to finish your course. You can't fight the good fight for 75% of your life and then the last 25% of your life live like... You have to finish your course. And what else do you have to do? You have to keep And then after you do those things, you have a crown of righteousness laid up for you. And on the last day, you'll be blessed to be able to live forever in heaven. So this is a general depiction of what you have to do in order to earn salvation. But there are some specifics. And there's, there's, some, there's a really good passage in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 7, if you would turn there. Jeremiah chapter 7, that, that really, really uh, depicts some of the, the situations that we have today. Um, as far as all the different uh, ways that people say you can be saved. I mean, if you really, really think about it, I know we all have common sense. If you really think about it, how can there be multiple ways to salvation? How can there be? One person says, this is how you're saved. Another person says, this is how you're saved. Another person says, this is how you're saved. Well, who's right? Well, they can't all be right because they're completely different. Amen. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 7. Let's start at verse 1. It says, the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord, mm -hmm. saying, stand in the gate of the Lord, of the Lord's house. And proclaim, there is this word, and say, hear the word of the Lord, all ye of Judah, that enter in at these gates to worship the Lord. So, this is not a place of worship. This is not a place where the church of Christ comes to meet. In a, in a parallel fashion, back then, they had a temple where they came to worship. They had a temple where they came in and, and they, they did all the things that were prescribed to them under the old law to worship God. So here Jeremiah is receiving instructions on what to tell the people to do that come into the house of the Lord. And it's very interesting how similar it is back then as it is today. See, even back then, they had false temples. See, see we, have, we have churches today that teach false doctrine, but even back then, see, there's nothing new under the sun. See, even back then, they had false temples. See, let's, let's read it. Let's read it. In verse 3, it says, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Amend your ways and your doings, and I will cause you to dwell in this place. Notice what God said. He said, Amend your ways. I mean, he's, he's talking about fix, fix what you've been doing. Right. Stop, stop sinning right. is what he's saying. So, so even back then, you had to repent. Mm -hmm. Repentance was necessary. See, they had all these sin offerings that they had to do, but, but God didn't, didn't want the sin offerings. He wanted his people to be righteous. Is what he wanted. In verse 4, it says, Trust not in lying words. Mm -hmm. Trust not in lying words. Wow. See, I, I'm sorry to say it. I'm, 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 really, wow. I'm really sad about it. But there's some preachers today that just be straight up lying. Yeah. Right. Now, now they might not really, they might not realize.
that what they're saying is, is lies. They might not have any, right. any ill intention. They think that what they're saying is right. But see, they have to understand that what God says is right and not what man says. They, they cannot put their own interpretation upon what God's word says. Right. They, have, they have to let the Bible speak for itself. So God told them not to trust in lying words, saying the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. This scripture right here is very deep because it's the same thing that's going on today. God told Jeremiah, stop listening to them liars that's talking about this is the church, this is the church, and this is the church, and any church will do. Wow. Even back then, he said, he said, trust not in lying words that say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord are these. All of these are the temple of the Lord. Uh, not not so. Not God so. said they are lies. Amen. Amen. Yeah. We have many, many, wow. many many thousands of different denominations. And that's what they're saying today. They're saying the temple of the Lord. The temple, the temple of the Lord. They're all, they're all the temple of the Lord. Just choose your church. Any of them are as good as the other. All of them will get you to heaven. Even though none of them speak the same thing. All of them say something different, but all of them are going to get you to heaven. Just, 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 just use some common sense for a second. That doesn't make any sense at all. How can somebody say, this is the way, and then you go to another person and say, this is the way, right. and you go to another person and you say, this is the way, up to a thousand different ways, and all of them are going to get you to heaven? Well, preacher, well, well, something wrong. Verse 5, it says, For if you thoroughly amend your ways and your doings, if you thoroughly execute judgment between a man and his neighbor. If you oppress not the, the sojourner, the fatherless, the widow, the, and shed and shed not innocent blood in this place, neither walk after the gods to your harm, then I will cause you to dwell in this place in the land that I gave to your fathers forever and ever. Behold, ye trust in lying words that cannot profit. Will you steal, murder, and commit adultery and swear falsely and burn incense unto Baal and walk after other gods whom ye know not and then come and stand before me in this house which is called by my name and say we are delivered to do these abominations. Wow. You're going to do whatever you want to do outside of church and then come into God's house and say I'm going to heaven. Mm -hmm. That's what he said. Not so, my friends. You can't do what you want to do and make it into that land. You can't just live. I thought some people teach that. Some people say, once saved, always saved. Once you, once you receive Jesus into your heart after you say the sinner's prayer, which, wow. which is nowhere in the Bible, by the way. No, sir. After you say the sinner's prayer, you accept Christ into your heart, and then you're saved for good. That's it. That's it. You don't have to worry about nothing else. As long as you just believe, you can sin all you want for the rest of your life, and you'll make it happen. That's, that sounds good, don't yeah, yeah. That sounds real good. But I, well, I tell you, if that was the truth, we wouldn't have to come here today. Why are you, why are you coming here if, if you're good? You're good. You don't have to do Why are you at church? Yeah, come on, somebody. Come on. Come on, let's, let's, let's think here. Let's think. Think about it. Think about it. How can you that are saved for good how can you that have nothing to lose still come on, come on, somebody? Well, well, Richard. It is not the truth. No, it's not. You can't do, you can't live how you want it and then expect to make it into heaven. Well, 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 let me ask you something. If, if, if once saved, always saved is true, what is judgment day for? Uh, What's judgment day for? The question. What's it for? What's the point of it? Why do you need to be judged if all you got to do is believe? You just got to believe you're good. 
What's judgment? What's the what? Make a whole big scene. Christ coming down with thousands of angels with a shout to come and be like, all right, everybody believe. Let's go. <laughs> come on, somebody. Come on. The devil believes in God. The devil has spoken to God. The devil was created by God. He knows that he exists. So because he believes, he's going to be in heaven with us? No. Absolutely not. Jump down to verse 22. Understand that God never wanted to, to make the sacrifices that he had to make in order to save us. It was, it was his intention for us to be righteous. It was in his intention to be perfect. And he explains that here in verse 22. It says, For I spoke not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings or sacrifices. When God brought Israel out of the land of Egypt, the first thing he told them was not, all right, y'all gonna y'all gonna be sinning all the time, so let's go ahead and get these burnt offerings ready. All right, let me teach you how to do it, so go ahead and do this. No, the first thing he told them was in verse 23, he said, but this thing commanded I them, saying, obey my voice, and I will be your God, and ye shall be my people, and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, that it may be well unto you, but they hearken not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and in the imagination of their evil heart and went backwards, not forward. Amen. God, it was never God's intention for us to have to continually make sin sacrifices. Amen. It was God's intention for us to be righteous. That's right. Amen. Well, he didn't command us to make recompense for our sin. He told us not to do it in the first place. Amen. Let's look at chapter 8. Go to chapter 8 and look at verse 5. Because sometimes this is the problem. Let's start at verse 4. Chapter 8 and verse 4. Just turn to chapter 8 and go to verse 4. It says, Moreover, thou shalt say unto them, Thus saith the Lord, Shall they fall and not rise? Well, that's what that's what uh, what uh, once saved always saved teaches. You fall and, and you just you good. You don't have to you don't have to repent. You don't have to to change your ways. Shall they fall and not rise? Shall he turn away and not return? Verse five. Why then is this people of Jerusalem slidden back by perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to deceit. They hold it on to that lie. You gotta let it, go. let it go. They refuse to return. Verse 6 it says, I hearkened and heard, but they spoke not aright. No man repented of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? And this is the problem. We don't say, What have I done? We say, Well, what did I do wrong? Amen. Not what have I done? What did I do? I ain't do nothing. <laughs> Everyone turned to his course. As a horse rushes into the battle. See, every man turns after his own course. And that's another issue because the Bible doesn't go along with your course. Because most of the time, your course is after the lust of the flesh. And the Bible is not going to satisfy the lust of the flesh. It's going to prick it up. Oh, it's going to cut up that flesh. And people don't like that. They don't like getting cut up by the word. So they want to change it. They want to change it around to make it say what they want it to say. All right. Well, look at verse, look at verse eight. It says, how do we say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us? Though certainly in vain may he, the pen of the scribes is in vain. The wise men are ashamed. They are dismayed and taken. Lo, they have rejected the word of the Lord and what? Wisdom is in. See, wisdom comes from the word of the Lord. That's right. If you want to be wise pertaining to salvation and even pertaining to really any moral aspect of life, you can get that from God's word. Amen. Wisdom comes from the word of God. So if you want to know how to attain, you want to know how to earn salvation, you get it from the word of God, not from a lying preacher. Not from me either, because I can make a mistake. 
I can say something that's not true. But you have to check in God's word to see if those things I'm saying are right. Wisdom comes from the word of God. Last one in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 9, looking at verse 23. It says, Thus saith the Lord, let not the wise man glory in his wisdom, neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches, but let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me, talking about God the Father, that I am the Lord who exerciseth loving kindness, justice, and righteousness in the earth, for in these things I delight, saith the Lord. We can't glory in any of the things that we do here on earth, but following after God. That's the only thing that we should glory in. Amen. And the thing is, is we have, we have a, a, a misunderstanding because God is the one that gives us all of the abilities that we have. How can we take credit and say, I did this and I did that, when it's God that formed you in the womb and continuously supplies the spirit of your energy? That's right. You can't do nothing without God. But you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't force you to follow him. So what you can take credit for is following after Christ. That's what you can take credit for. Because everything else he helped you do anyway. But he's not going to force you to follow him. He wants you to choose him. So don't glory in your wisdom. Don't glory in your might. Don't glory in your riches. Glory after following Christ. And following Christ is the way to attain salvation. See, salvation is, is something that must be strived for. Okay? It must be highly sought after in order to earn it, in order to obtain it. You have to really want it. Not like when you ask for a drink. You know, like we ask for something to drink. I hear it all the time. Some, uh, somebody asks for something to drink, and they'd be like, okay, uh, here's some water. I'm like, ah, oh, never mind. Well, you wasn't thirsty. <laughs> you wasn't thirsty then. You're not that thirsty. I'll offer you water, and you're like, nah, you wanted some soda or something. You're not that thirsty. So you have to you have to strive after salvation. You have to, to want it. You have to really desire it in order to earn it. You have to be an honest man to obey the gospel. That's right. So salvation, you have to you have to want salvation like, like you want to breathe. Let's think about it. Think about it. If you have you have you ever been holding your breath on the water? Well, you're in that in, in that moment where you're holding your breath, are you thinking about your job the next day? Are you are you thinking about you know like all your projects that you have on hold? Are you thinking about you know having to go back home and clean or whatever you got to do? Are you thinking about anything other than air at that moment? You're thinking about breathing. So you have to want salvation as bad as you want to breathe. You have, to, you have to sincerely desire it in order to obtain it. Because if there is not a sincere desire in your heart, as soon as something comes and gets in your way, believe me, it will. Because the devil is busy. There is something that's going to come and get in your way. And if you don't have a sincere desire to be saved, you will be lost. The devil is going to work hard to try to get you back. He's going to work hard to try to get you back. You have to sincerely want it. You have to strive. You have to press towards the mark. And you know what? I find that 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 salvation is something like like when you when you go to college and you try to earn a degree. It's something like. Uh, a parable, if you will. And see, if you if you don't have enough credits, you can't graduate. Mm -hmm. You know, freshman year, you can you can be undeclared, but eventually you have to pick a major. Mm -hmm. Eventually, you have to to pick if you're going to follow after a certain major. Eventually, you have to pick if you're going to follow Christ or not. Mm -hmm. and see, if you if you miss 
like I said, if you don't have enough credits, you, cra you can't graduate. But if you miss one part of being saved, see, uh, people will do the first four steps, which is okay. hear, believe, repent, and confess. But then they say, well, baptism isn't necessary. Even though there's probably 50 scriptures in the New Testament that say that talk about being baptized. Right. Uh, no, no, those don't matter. You know? He's talking about being baptized with fire. No, he's not. He's talking about water baptism, being buried with Christ. Can you read? <laughs> <laughs> baptism is necessary, but if you miss the last step, you don't have enough credits to graduate. They're not going to give you your degree. They might let you walk across the stage. <laughs> They let you walk. They hand you a hand you a little book. There ain't nothing in it. <laughs> you don't have enough credits. You didn't do what they told you to do. We can understand that. Well, man, I'm missing. I'm missing this class. It's a four credit class. It has a lab. I need to take this class, or I'm not going to graduate. We can understand that. But when we look in the Bible and see the fifty to hundred scriptures about baptism, we're like, no, nah, you know, I, I don't. I don't need to do that. I don't need to do that to, to get salvation. Yeah. Jesus was baptized. That's right. And he told John, John said, you should be the one baptizing me. But Jesus said, I'm doing this to fulfill all righteousness. That's what he told John. So that's why you need to be baptized to fulfill all righteousness. But still, people don't think they have to do it. They don't think it's necessary. I mean, honestly, they're just ignoring scriptures. But see, situations are different for everybody. You know, some people, some people are raised up in the church. Some people are raised up to go to college. Some people are, are um, you know, like I said, raised up in the church, and they still sometimes end up going astray. They grew up in the church, and sometimes they yeah. end up going astray. You raise a child, talk to them about going to college, talk to them about education their whole life, and then when they get grown and they make their own decision, they flunk out of college. It happens. Yeah. Situations are, are different for everybody else. Mm -hmm. Some people go in there for a while and they drop out and they never finish. Mm -hmm. right. It's the same thing with salvation. Some people come, some people go. It's a, it's a part of life. It's sad, though. They don't understand the, the, the hope of salvation. They don't understand the terror of God. See, knowing the terror of God, we persuade men. Right. <clears throat> But see, the reason why this happens is because many are called, but few are chosen. The Bible says, enter ye in at the straight gate. At the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. When once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us, and he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence you are. Then you shall begin to say, We have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know you not whence ye are. Depart from me, all ye workers of iniquity. In Matthew's account, it says, enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many be which go in thereat, because, the, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find one. You see, when I, when I went to school, when I went to college, I just thought it was really interesting how they introduced us freshmen. One of our, our first freshman meeting, we had a speaker that came up and told us, basically, most of y'all are not going to graduate. Hmm. That's what he told us. He, he, every, every freshman was in this big auditorium, and he said, look to your right, look to the person on your right, mm -hmm. and look to the person on your left. Two of y'all are not going to graduate. Hmm. hmm. Chances are the person on your right and the person on your left are not going to graduate. And I tell you right now this day, those two people that I looked at did not graduate. They definitely dropped out. Wow. Well, he wasn't lying. I mean, it was harsh. <laughs> but he wasn't lying. You see, the, the statistics say 59% of college students graduate. But see, there's a dip. See, 59% is a lot. That's a lot. Imagine if 59% of people 
we're, we're, we're in the Church of Christ. Yeah, Amen. yeah, yeah. That's like four billion people. Yeah. That's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of people. How many members of the Church of Christ you think are, are here today? Mm -hmm. Not four billion. I tell you that. No. But Jesus already told us that straight is the gate and narrow is the way, and few find it. Well. You see, see, it's, it's difficult because you already have to, to, to dig through the seven billion, seven to eight billion people that are alive today. You have to dig through them to find somebody that claims to be a Christian. Mm -hmm. This person says that they're a Christian. Mm -hmm. Now, then you have to dig through those people to, to find members of the Church of Christ. Mm -hmm. And then you have to dig through the members of the Church of Christ to find people that are living faithful. Yeah. <laughs> That's why Christ said, few enter therein. He wasn't lying. We still have to do our best to save as many souls as possible. But we understand that there's only going to be a few. This is why when, when I see something that everybody's doing, everybody's doing this thing, it's the new hot thing, I'm, I'm going to go this way. I'm, I'm going to stay away from that thing. Because... God said that wide is the gate that leads to destruction. So chances are, if everybody's doing it, it's wrong. Chances are. Well, I'm not saying every time. But chances are, if everybody's doing said thing, it's most likely wrong. It's most likely the wrong thing to do. So, so we were forewarned already that a, a few would take the path that leads to to salvation, meaning few people would make it in in the end. And this is why we shouldn't be surprised that, that churches, churches, pews that tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth are filled to capacity. As a matter of fact, honestly, we as Christians should naturally be alarmed when, yeah. when a church is, is overpacked. Well. I, I, I would love for this church to be overpacked. Believe me. I don't have anything against big congregations. There are big congregations with sound doctrine. Um, they exist. But what I'm telling you is that most of the time, mm -hmm. where people flock to, right. they are not telling the truth. Because people don't like the truth. Right. Because the truth cuts you up. Mm -hmm. It makes you have to change some things in your life. And people don't like to change themselves. Yeah. They say, I'm good the way I am. You just accept me for who I am. Imagine that. Imagine telling God on Judgment Day. You ought to accept me for the way I am. Come on now. Well, well, preacher. We really should be alarmed and, and, and wonder if they're really telling the truth to the people. See, we all know that the truth hurts. You can, you can sit up in the pew with a smile on your face and in your heart you get it cut up. I know it. I know it because it happens to me. Well, we ought to be glad when a preacher tells us something to help us change our lives. Yeah, yeah. Not true. But but the but instead we get we get upset and want to leave the congregation. He talking about me. Don't know nothing about what's going on in your situation, but he talking about me. Some, some congregations are aware that, that people act like this. They, they know that, that people get offended. So what they do is they, they change it. They say, I, you know what? That's going to offend everybody, so we're not going to talk about marriage. That's going to offend everybody, so we're not going to preach on sin and preach on people changing their lives. We're going to preach on prosperity. We're going to preach on love. We're going we're gonna to preach on all of these positive things and, and ignore the fact that these people are living in sin and headed to destruction. That's not love. That's, right. That's not love at all. It's, it's a it's a it's a um, it's a very misconstrued thing, especially with our children. We 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 think that showing them love is is protecting them from from hurt and and not allowing them to understand what hurt is and disappointment. We give them everything that they want, and then then later on in life they're gonna realize that that, that life ain't gonna give them nothing they want. Then what are they going to do? 
What have you done for them if you give them everything? They have to understand discipline. And it's the same thing with thoughts. I mean, some people's feelings are going to get hurt, but that's the Bible tells us that. It says the Bible is like a double edged sword, mm -hmm. it's sharper than any two edged sword. Right. The Word of God is seen as a sword, it's seen as a weapon, it's going to hurt. But what happens is after it is hurt, and after you mend your ways, after you amend your ways like God told the people to do in Jeremiah, what happens is it heals yes. you, and you're better than you were before. That's right. Some churches, they tell fallacies and 